But no, what I want to speak with you tonight on is part two of this. Only a consumer. We're surrounded by consumerism, right? It's all around us. It's what we're taught to be, basically, a consumer. It's even praised. We spoke about it last week, how we can sometimes let those things penetrate into our lives and our relationship between God and others. So last week we talked about our relationship with God. How often we come with all these lists of requests, but do we come with a sacrifice? Do we give something of ourself unto him? This week what we want to talk about is others. Are you just a consumer? Am I just a consumer when it comes to my relationship with others? In Luke 10, verse 27, it says this. This is Jesus speaking. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, we take care of ourselves pretty well, right? I'm looking around at all of you, good-looking people, you take care of yourself. Some of you might have put cologne on before you got here. Some of you might have showered. I didn't do any of those. No, I'm kidding. Um, Whatever, or perfume. Sorry, ladies, perfume. Whatever it is. But here's some essential things we have to have. Food, sleep, hygiene, health, Safety, right? Those are kind of essential things necessary to us for our survival. If you are a really, really stinky, stinky person, you're not going to have a lot of friends. I'm sorry, I'm saying it. No, none of you are here, don't worry. We would have sprayed you with Febreze when you came in. Um, But no, these are like necessary things we need, we have to have. But then there's kind of the non-essentials, but they're really nice. We like them. Food. We like food that's tasty, things that we like. Amen, that's right. Come on. So you have that certain food. It's like, yeah, of course I can eat anything technically unless I have a really bad food allergy. I could eat this and this, but I'm normally going to go to a restaurant, look at the menu, and get what I want, what I like, what tastes good for me. Sleep is great, but a cozy bed is even better. Anna and I, we just moved, like we'd said, and we went right from moving to where... Our, the carpets didn't come yet to where we're living in now. And so we couldn't move our beds, and the whole bottom floor was just filled with furniture. We had nowhere to sleep. So we went to my parents' house. And my sister and brother in law live there now. And so the upstairs is kind of like an apartment. So we were on this air mattress that deflated every night. And so the first night we were sleeping there together, literally like, When you're by yourself and it deflates, you kind of sink in the middle, and it can be a little cozy if it doesn't go too low. It's like you're surrounded. But when it's two of you, you just roll into each other. So Anna and I are like waking up forehead to forehead, and it's like, this is sweaty forehead to sweaty forehead. It's like, this is not a good situation. Who's going to bail out first? So we go to the couch. One's on the couch. One's in there. And then in the middle of the night, I'm on the couch. She hits like the the pump or whatever. So it's like, boom. And that scared me so bad. So we just, we had had that situation for the past like six days and it was bad. It was bad. And last night we finally got back to our cozy bed and it was like, this is glorious. Just sat there from like 10 to 12 at night, just sat in bed. Like this is a nice bed. (laughs) This is cozy. So that's not really an essential thing, but I like it. I like a cozy bed. Hygiene, you can wash yourself with any type of soap, but maybe you like Old Spice, Body Wash, or Irish Spring, or Dove. Yeah, guys, it's all right if you like Dove. There's no shame in that. So we have those things, health, vitamins, supplements, to get stronger, look a little bit better. Not necessarily is it something that's a necessity or essential to us, but it can help enhance our life, how we look, how we feel. Safety is important, but we kind of like comfort as well and luxury. You can drive a really safe car, but it's a lot more fun to drive a really safe car that looks really good, that feels really comfortable and has little bottom warmers, (laughs) right? (laughs) People are like, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, (laughs) mm-hmm. But we're surrounded by that, inundated with it, the luxury of life. 
And I am in no way saying that these things are negative and bad and wrong. But when our perspective begins to alter and shift, and when these things get out of order, they become very dangerous. I mean, look at the American dream. All right, I'm successful. I have my retirement fund. I have a family. I have a home. I have, we say it all the time, the white picket fence. I have two, maybe three vehicles. My kids are doing all this and doing all that. And then by 55 or 60, I'm retired. Then I can really start living life, enjoying, and there it is. I'm not going against retirement or success or families or homes or white picket fences. They're beautiful. But see, that's where our focus has been. It's, I mean, it's around us all the time. That's our goal. That's our means. That's what we need to do. We have to achieve this. It's what we live in. Even our nature lends to that, instinctively to protect ourselves. You hear a loud noise. Scares you. Protect yourself. Some of you are like, I fight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do that by yourself in the house. It's awesome. But no. Our nature lends to it. When you even see nature and animals and their instincts to survive. And crazy things, sometimes even animals will eat their own offspring to survive. We kind of live in that whole world. It's around us. It surrounds us. Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, you know what, Pastor Stephen, here's the deal. The truth of the matter is, if I didn't look out for myself, I wouldn't have survived. That was my life story. I had to look out for myself. I had to be selfish. I didn't have parents or family that loved me, took care of me. I didn't have any of that. So if I wasn't selfish, I wouldn't have survived. I'm not degrading or discounting your story. But what I am saying is this is where we all should be and we all are at a place that without something, something radical, something transformational, were selfish people. Something had to take place. See, Christianity and the teachings of Jesus are demanding something polar opposite of the world we live in. Polar opposite. Matthew 10, 8. This is Jesus speaking. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, and here the the main point is, freely you have received, freely received give. See, God doesn't just demand us to love others as ourselves. He says, take it one step further. Give. Give to others. Matthew 10, 8, another version of it, the new revised standard version, it says this, you have received without payment. Give without payment. Man, Jesus is calling us to something. He's demanding something of us. We freely experience grace, salvation. We didn't deserve it. We got it. And then Jesus says, now freely give. God requires, he requires us to give. There's a great example of this. The Apostle Paul, he pens one third of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was a man whose life was changed by God. And he's a staple in Christianity. Now he's in Ephesus. There's a book in the New Testament called Ephesians. It's the church in Ephesus. Paul lived there for three years. Now let's paint the picture here. Anna and I, we've been back here as young adults pastors here at Smithtown for two years now. Coming up on two years. Yeah, this month. Just a couple days. Two years we've been here. And I feel like some of you, who I didn't know before that, we have built some great relationships, right? deep friendships. So Paul's been there for three years with this church, and he's about to leave. He's about to depart. This is his closing statement. He says to them in Acts 20, verse 35. He said, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul knows, too, that he's going to never return back to Ephesus. 
Those are his last words. Think about that. How important it was that he thought, if I could leave you with one thing, it's the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Wow. It tells me, it stops me in my tracks. It says something is important. No, something is vital. No, something is necessary in my walk in following Jesus for me to give. So another example in John 6. There's a crowd of 5,000 people. It says 5,000 men, so even more scholars say than that. Could have been upwards of 20,000 people, and Jesus is speaking to them. And some of you might say, I know this story. Yeah. Jesus looks, and he says, okay, how are we going to feed them? And all of a sudden, his disciples are like, brainstorm, brainstorm. We've got to think about just And Jesus, I'm sorry, we've come up with this idea. We can't. It would take years and years of our salaries and then time to go into town and then get all the food for this many people. It's impossible. But here in John 6, verse 8, I want us to look at something. It says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How far will they go among so many? We know the story, Jesus takes those, he multiplies them, feeds the thousands, and then there's more left afterwards. This is what I want to point out tonight. In that story there in John, there's a contrast between the disciples and the boy. There's a contrast because the disciples, you know what they did? They had more resources. They really did. They're grown men, professionals. They had more resources, but logically they looked at the situation and they knew they did not have enough resource to solve the problem. So guess what they did? Nothing. But the contrast is that there's a boy. He gave the little he had and it made all the difference. He gave the little he had and made all the difference. Don't limit your ability to give on the limitations of your resources. Don't Limit that. Your ability, my ability to give just because we have limited resources because this was a great example where this little boy, precious in his heart, pure in his heart, gave the little he had and God did something miraculous. Jesus got the glory. See, sometimes we like to give out of our plentiful resources maybe hoping that we'll get a little bit of that glory. This little boy, we don't have his name. We don't hear anything else about him. He had one moment. He gave. But it's one of the most profound, famous miracles of Jesus where he got the glory. Many people throughout history, in the Christian faith, throughout Christendom, were people who practice, who live the lifestyle of giving. St. Anthony is one of my favorite. He goes by St. Anthony the Great. He was a desert monk. I've talked about him before. I've done a lot of study and research on him. He inherited from his parents when they had died like 300 acres of land. He's a young man here, lots of wealth. Him and his sister, he decides to sell it all, give it all to the poor, and then he follows God, becomes a monk in the desert, serving others, taking care of others. He dies with nothing but a cloak. I'm not saying we have to go to these extremes. God called Anthony to do that. Other examples, Jim Elliott. Some of you might have heard of him. He was a missionary to Ecuador. Him and four other men really felt called to these these native Indians there in Ecuador, deep in the bush. They didn't really have that many resources. But they gave. They gave their lives. They were killed. It's a crazy story. If you read more about that, Elizabeth Elliot, his wife, years later they go back and those same people who murdered her husband, she brings them to know Jesus and changes a whole tribe. Mother Teresa, we don't have to go into detail about that. She obviously had nothing. She gave it all up to God, to the church. She went there in India, some of the worst areas, and gave daily. She says this quote, If you give what you do not need, it is not giving. If you give what you do not need, it is not giving. Her life, did it not show that, reveal that? 
C.S. Lewis says this, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. I know this is kind of one of those messages that gets a little uncomfortable. Mm-mm. What are you going to ask at the end of this? Are you going to have us all take off our watches and our hats and put them at the altar here and all this stuff? No, you can put that in the Dominican Republic thing back there. No, I'm kidding. Um, Seriously, though. No. Um, I know it can get a little uncomfortable, but that's okay. Because if something gets me uncomfortable, because I've been brewing on this for this last week, so I've been very uncomfortable in my own life, it makes me look at my life analyze it a little bit. How many of you have heard of Old Saint Nick, otherwise known as? Santa Claus. Yes, okay. Santa Claus. Well, you know, that's kind of the folk legend side of things. The whole character of Santa Claus outside of the North Pole stuff is actually based upon a historical godly man. Nicholas of Myra. Now, Old Saint Nick, you might have heard that statement. Saint Nicholas. He was Saint Nicholas. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He grew up on the southern coast of what is now Turkey. He had wealthy parents who raised him. And they raised him to be a devout Christian. And at a young age, guess what happened? His parents, they died. Nicholas was wealthy. He was rich. They died, his parents, because of an epidemic, probably a plague at that time. Even though they're a wealthy family, the medicine at that time couldn't take care of him, so he's left alone, an orphan. But even at that young age, he decides to obey Jesus' commands. He sells, gives away all of his possessions, and gives it to the poor. He sold his inheritance to assist the needy, the sick, the hurting, the dying, and then from that children and other orphans, and that's where the legend begins to build where we have what we now call Santa Claus. I'm gonna tell my kids about the real Saint Nick, okay? Saint Nicholas. Now I might even dress up like him in a robe. Yeah, very cool. I know, I know, it's awesome. But look at that. A man who decided to give all that he had, so much so his life was so impactful in how generous he was, how charitable he was to give of himself that we have the folk legend hundreds of years later Santa Claus. And the sad thing is it's been distorted. Because now it became all about what? I want this for Christmas. I want this. I need this. That wasn't the harder root of St. Nicholas whatsoever. It was to give everything to help those in need. See, we as Christians, we have to express extreme generosity in all we do. I'm not just talking in finances. I'm talking in everywhere, in your time, in your emotion, in conversations with people, giving of yourself. Deuteronomy 15.10 says this, give generously to him, your neighbor. Do so without a grudging heart. Because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Proverbs 22.9 says this, a generous man will himself be blessed for he shares his food with the poor. James 1.27 says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans, widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Giving more than a moment We live in a great country, America. Yes, I know there are a lot of moral issues and heavy issues of our culture that we have to combat. But as far as being charitable, we're a very charitable country. There's a lot of nonprofits and things that have grown here that all are about giving. But what Jesus is demanding us to do is much more than momentary charity. He's calling us to be a people who give, a people who it's our lifestyle, constantly giving. What's stopping you from giving? Maybe it's this. Do you value temporal things, success, objects over people? Let's get real here. Do you value those things more than a a person? 
You know, so often we get caught up with the vision, our plan, the 10-year plan, our success, and we look past the people in the midst of it. When I went to Oral Roberts University, I was studying theology. I didn't know if I wanted to be a professor, a teacher, nonprofit stuff, pastor. I didn't know, but I was studying theology. And with that, I was surrounded by a lot of other guys who wanted to go into some sort of full-time ministry, which obvious full-time ministry doesn't happen without people. You know, or it's just a room. It's really weird. <laughs> just think about that. This whole place empty, so I'm just walking around. Great. Great. Everything looks good. So obviously people. But I was with so many young men, young women, had their goal, had their plan. I'm going to go through school here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a church, or I'm going to be a part of this nonprofit that feeds the homeless and takes care of those in need and all this stuff. And suddenly it was like an epiphany moment because I realized that we were walking past those very people to get to our next class. The facility guy, the people who worked in the lunchroom, ex-convicts in the lunchroom, Oh, it was maybe felt a little awkward with some of these people. They might have been socially awkward. And so instead you just ignored, you pushed aside. But suddenly I realized, wait a second. Am I so focused on this 10-year plan or the end all, which is going to be really good, which is going to change lives and health people. But in the midst of it, I'm walking by those very people that I want to minister to. Double standard. Out of ignorance, but nevertheless a double standard. How dare I? Live in the present. Live in the present because you're not promised tomorrow, but you're promised right now. Maybe another thing, this idea that when I get what I need, then I will give. Hey, when I get, when I get what I need to feel safe, to feel good, I can provide all this type, then I'll give. You've probably heard this before. John D. Rockefeller was asked, how much is enough money? Just a little bit more, he said. If you study John D. Rockefeller, the men who built America, look that up on the History Channel, great, great series, awesome. You'll see how wealthy he was. Literally, the amount of money this man had. How much is enough money, sir? Just a little bit more. It will never be enough. It will never be enough. There will always be another excuse. There will always be another thing to achieve. If it's not your 10-year, then it's your 20-year plan. And this much retirement so I can do this much. We can't think like that. It's here, it's now, it's in the present. Maybe you say, I don't have the time to give. Listen, Pastor Stephen, that's great. That's cool. You get to work with people. I don't. I crunch numbers all day, and then I got a strict schedule. And then I work another night shift here and there. And so I am busy, busy, busy. I don't have the time to give. There will never be a perfect time. I've talked to other people before. They've said, I want to get married, but I want to wait till this, this, and this works out. And I walk through counseling with people, and sometimes in their seasons of life, it would cause more stress to get married at that. So Try to give them godly counsel in that. But most of the time when people kind of say the time thing, I have to stop them and say, listen, I want you to know there will never be a perfect time to get married. Something will happen. Something will take place. This new job. Start. So, so I say this to you. Yeah, there are legitimate reasons. But many times we kind of use those excuses to get away from it. I don't have the time to give. There's never a wrong time to give. And there's always time to give and bless others. It's always the perfect time. Jesus was constantly on his way to things. A man on his way to change humanity, the world as we know it. And beggars, tax collectors, blind, sick people were interrupting him, getting in his way he could have legitimately said, I don't have time. I have to go raise someone from the dead. Do you say that in your daily life? So I have to make these copies right now. And I understand that. Be a good employee. I'm all about that. You need to be that. But hear what I'm saying? I've got to go put gas in my car right now, this second. 
Jesus is like, I have to go raise someone from the dead. I need to go make a sacrifice for the entire world. But he stopped. He took time to daily give of himself. Maybe the last one is you say, hey, I don't have the resources. Who defines what resource is? Are you here? Can you speak? Can you hug someone? Can you talk with someone? Do you have a dollar or two in your pocket? I don't have enough resources. Listen, that can't be our excuse. Give of yourself then. And we, we talked about this last week, story of the woman. She was there at the temple. She gave her offering. It was nothing. It was nothing. If we looked at it literally, worthwise, it was nothing. Other people were thrown in tons and tons. And Jesus said, see her? She's the one who truly gave because she gave out of her nothingness. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm going to be real with you. I just don't want to give. I just don't want to give. Call me selfish. Call me what you want. I just don't want to give. I want to invite the band back up here. But Jesus' love transforms. His love transforms. Remember at the beginning I said it's hopeless? Really, it is hopeless. We are self-centered individuals. It is truly hopeless unless something takes place. His love. If you want to live a lifestyle, you can live in momentary giving and giving, but it's going to run dry. It's going to get empty. But his love is what transforms us, our very being. I want to read to you a story in Luke 10. You can turn with me if you'd like, or you can just listen. Luke 10, 25 through 37. Some of you might have heard it before. You're familiar with this story called the Good Samaritan. I'm going to read through it quickly for you. I want to paint that picture of what's taking place here. Jesus is sitting there. He's sharing. He just shares what we read earlier. Teacher comes and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked him, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? So the man said, well, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. The man says, but I'm going to try to justify myself. So he says, who is my neighbor? He's kind of asking it, to try to catch Jesus, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells this story. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, a holy man, happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He did nothing. So a Levite came, another holy man, and when he came to that place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan came. The Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other. I'm not talking Brooklyn Bronx. I'm talking they hated each other violently, hated each other, looked down upon one another. They would have been considered enemies. The long history and long past of being enemies. And as that Samaritan traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go, go and do likewise. Man. The man, the Samaritan, gave of himself. Jesus' point that he's saying is not only to love, but love in action. And love in action is giving to transform, to restore us. Literally, 
Human beings, biologically, when we give something, we receive it or we witness that act of generosity taking place. Endorphins are released in our mind and in our body. It gives us a sense of pleasure, almost like a high. That's biologically proven, scientifically proven. It almost gives me a glimmer of hope to say, whoa, this is kind of a part that God, he created us to be this way. But yet it gets so distorted in our society and our world around us. We have to fight that tension to say, I am called to live differently. And the only way I can maintain that and live in that is if I experience the transformation of his love. Giving is not always convenient or epic. It's not like those commercials, you know, it's like you give something then a band shows up behind you in the elevator. You gave, you know, you're the man and everyone's like, Woo, you know, it's not always epic. People aren't watching you and observing you, coming up and congratulating you on having a generous heart. It's not always convenient. This Samaritan was on his way to do stuff. He had business to take care of. And there's a man there, not only does he fix his wounds, he picks him up, he stops his schedule, puts him on his donkey, the one he was riding, takes him, pays for him to be taken care of, says, I'll come back. That's not convenient. Sometimes giving is inconvenient or even misunderstood. But so is Calvary. Jesus Christ gave of his life. It was inconvenient. He died, gave his life for you, for me. Misunderstood. People were looking, I thought you were going to change the world, but now look at you. You're on a cross. You're being killed. Many of his disciples, all of them thought it's over. But we know, we know because we're the fruit of it. In that moment, something priceless and eternal was taking place. So let's stand up together now and this time as we worship. Be willing to sacrifice because with great sacrifice truly comes great blessings. As we worship now, let's give Jesus our all. But let's be people who live as givers unto others.